let's don't denigrate the technology. Let's utilize it for the cause of Jesus Christ. Even if Satan is the prince and the power of the air, we are taking back that which the enemy has stolen. Amen? Amen. Grab your Bibles, if you would, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I'm going to continue a little bit where I left off Sunday morning. And I didn't give you um, a scripture that we'll get to in a minute. But I want you to go to Ephesians 3, 18. We'll pick it up, start at verse 7 again, then we'll go on down. It says, now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved, this is again 2 Corinthians 3, verse 7. Just bring me down a little bit. There you go. Perfect. Up just a fuzz. I'm happy. I'm happy. There you go. Now if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious? If the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious is no glory, now in comparison with their surpassing glory. And if what was transitory came with glory, how much greater, everybody say how much greater, is the glory of that which lasts? Verse 12. Therefore, I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 12. Therefore, that means in light of that, since we have such a hope, I mean, you know, hope's always future. Faith is always present. I'm going to say it again. Hope is always future. Faith is always present. So when you're hoping for something, you're anticipating something in the future that you're moving towards it or you're bringing it into the now. Faith is always in the now. We already know that Hebrews 11.1 1 says now faith is. Now faith is. Now it's in the now. Now faith is. It's in the immediacy. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, nobody can please God except with faith. For it is impossible to please God. Say, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But He is, note this, a rewarder of those that do what? Diligently seek Him. Okay? And uh, I got my, my tablet out here with my notes on it, and it just went down with me, so I'm having to mess with that. Now, going on. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Did I tell you that the righteous are bold as a lion? Proverbs 28, 1, the, the wicked flee when no one is chasing them, yet the righteous are bold as a lion. Then it says, we are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. But their minds are made dull, for to this day the same veil remains. When the old covenant is read, it has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. So that means all of those Israelis, all of those Jewish people, who we love dearly, by the way, if that veil doesn't come off, you know what, they're veiled because they've not exposed themselves to Jesus Christ the Redeemer. Now, I know recently Dale and Pam were in Israel. If you go up towards Nazareth, you will find that there are these guys along the roadside. I don't know if you saw any of them when you were there or not. I don't know if Ian, you saw these guys when you were in Israel or not. But there is these guys, they wear these baggy pants. Now, you thought MC Hammer brought that in, you know, back in the, was it the 80s? You can't touch this. Remember that? And he had the baggy pants and, and looked like pajamas, right? He's running around pajamas. And uh, yeah, anyways, he had the pajamas on. Did you have some pajamas? I think I had like one pair. That's all I could do. Man, those things were way too funky for me, man. So I think I had one pair. One pair is all I could remember having. But literally in Israel, there is a sect of people that are men that they believe that the Messiah could not only be, just be born to a woman, but also to a man. So they literally have a pair of pants that are like the MC Hammer pants, except the crotch is clear down about to here. And the reason is they believe that it could be so miraculous, they could deliver that baby supernaturally anytime, and they drop into those baggy pants. (laughs) I'm telling you the truth. Did you see these guys? Oh, you got to go check this out. You had the wrong guides. I have Doe Friedman, man, one of the generals in the Israeli army. He knows everything that's going on in Israel. He says, see those guys? That's what they do. They wear that believing that the, the miracle of birth could even take place with them. Now, isn't that whacked out or what? We love them, don't we? Can I tell you, the Messiah has already come, and he's going to come again. And how I know he's going to come again, because even what's taking place in Israel right now, I don't know if you know Hamas is throwing lobbing rockets over at Jerusalem, at Tel Aviv. Right now, are you following the news? Yep. Stuff is really cooking right now. It's ramping up tremendously. 
The throne of shield intercepted the rocket so nobody is destroyed. Thank God. But really, you know, people say, well, let's, let's, let's believe for peace and let's believe for this and that and everything else. And how many of you know Psalms 122 verse 6 says, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. You all ought to be doing that. But the only peace that will come is when the Prince of Peace comes. His name is Jesus. So they have this hope. And he says, we have this hope. We're very bold. We're not like Moses who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing and what was passing away. But their minds are dull for this day the veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ, only in Christ is it taken away. Verse 15. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. It's one thing to have it over your eyes. Some of you have spiritual eyes as well as physical eyes. And heart that are either open and receptive or not. It says, it says, even the veil covers their hearts, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom or liberty, depending on your version. 18 is our key verse, and we all, that's us sitting here today, that's every believer who with unveiled faces contemplate, we're looking at, we're anticipating, we're looking into that mirror, which is the Word of God, we're contemplating the Lord's glory, are being transformed into His image. So the more that we look at this Word, which is the revelation of who he is and what he is and what's available for us as a believer. The more that we meditate on that, the more we mutter it, the more we chew on it, what ends up happening, we begin to become transformed into his image. We become like him into the image with ever-increasing glory. So the glory goes from one level to another level to another level to another level, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Can you say amen to that? I want to talk tonight about the subject entitled Growing Into Full Maturity. Now, Click over to Ephesians, if you would, please. One of my favorite books of the Bible. Paul writes all about the church, how the church is structured, how the church ought to function, instructions to the church and Christian living, how to be matured and grow up. And uh, one, of my, one of my default passages is always Ephesians chapter 4. So I want you to go there with me, if you would. Chapter 4, starting at verse number 11. Around here, we know this passage very well. But it's really verses 14 through 16 that I want to hone in, but I preface it by reading this first. It says in verse 11, So Christ himself gave the apostles, prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. Now, these are fivefold leaders. We already know that given by Jesus Christ to the body of Christ. They can be in a local church, and they can also be translocal going from place to place. Okay, They can be itinerant. They can also lead a church. And then it says this, the reason for the fivefold ministry leaders is specifically for, specifically for this reason, to equip, to train, to prepare God's people for works of service. Why is that? Now, here's where we get into the meat of this, what I want to talk about, about growing into full maturity. So that, here's the reason why, so that we all reach the, until we reach the unity in the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, everybody say become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That means we grow up. We attain full stature as a man or woman of God. We grow into full maturity. God wants all of us. How many of you know we're all in that process right now? We're growing into full maturity. I've not arrived. You've not arrived. Now, I believe we get to a level of maturity, but I think there's a continual progression and growth and development that continues on. Okay, the moment you stop growing, you might as well go to be to heaven would be with Jesus. The moment that you quit, the quit doing anything for the kingdom, you might as well go to heaven because your, your, your assignment's not over, but you're making it over, all right? So now take a look at verse 14. This is what I want to get into. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching, by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming, instead speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature, there's that word again, mature body, tell you, perfected, of him who is the head. That's Jesus or that is Christ. That means the anointed one. From him, the whole body, say me. me. Reach over and touch somebody and say you. Me. Touch somebody else, say you. The whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. Each part does its work. Now, take a look at your hand. How many of you have got muscles, you've got ligaments in your arms and your legs and, and all of it? Anybody ever strained a, a muscle or pulled a tendon or something like that? And it's sore and you limp around. You know what I'm talking about, that feeling? And you're, you, you know what it is, right? How important that is to you. That's why you need all of us together to accomplish God's purpose as we do our part or do our work. He says, grows up, builds itself up in love as each part does its work. 
I'm putting this down. It keeps closing on me. I need to figure out how to keep it open. <clears throat> anyway. Growing into full maturity implies certain things, all right? It implies certain things. Two things that I want to talk about specifically tonight. Point number one, as you're taking notes, is we must grow past infancy. So if we're going to grow into full maturity, you'd all agree, we must grow past infancy. Is that right? I'm going to do a little survey right now. How many of you have been born again for one year or less? Let me see your hands. One year or less. One year or less. How many of you have been born again for, let's say, five years or less? Let me see your hands. Okay, one. Good. Okay. How many of you here today have been born again less than 10 years? Let me see your hands. How about 15? Okay. All right. There's two, three, four, five. I have a wonderful story that Don, <laughs> we can't, the names need to be remain nameless, but <laughs> we were sitting at lunch one day and Don was telling us the story with one of my former elders. It was so awesome because he was the elder at the church at that time and she was, she was a heathen believer and, and uh, it began to be a parking situation. It was a traffic situation and this, and this former elder of mine uh, chewed her out and cussed her out and everything else and she, she gave him the number one, you're the most important person finger too and and uh oh is that what it was okay anyway so he gave you the finger oh you just accommodated him this is one of my elders found out about this later one of my elders chewed her out flipped her off and everything else and so she just being the sinner that she was she accommodated him both barrels i believe and i'm i'm embellishing it now but she was a professional her mom taught her personally <laughs> I should ask you if I had the rights to that story or not before I went in. I was too late now. You jumped in, so it must be okay. You guys would all know I'm a, know this person. I won't say who it was, sex or anything, but you know who it is. I'm off of it. Helen says, get off of it quick. I know that person needs a little more growth. <laughs> Example, a little more growth. All right, how did I get on to that? Holy moly. That wasn't God, was it? Infancy, yes, yeah, infancy. Oh, I know what it was. Okay, 15 years or less, all right. 20 years or less, let me see your hands. Okay, one more. How about 25 years or less? Okay, a little more. All right, let's just say this. How many of you have been born again at least 30 years or more? 30 more. Look at that. Turn around, just look, 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 look. That's two-thirds or more of the people in this place. No, in terms of we need more people here that are not born again. I understand that. I understand that. No, I'm with you in that regard. I, I understand that. Huh? Oh, you want to come preach for a while? <laughs> Get up here. Don't sit down there. They can't see you down there. <laughs> a little bit. It's because I love you. We're waiting for what? For you to talk. I have nothing to say. Well, give me that mic back. <laughs> you might later. You never know. I know, but I need to hear that for the <laughs> crowd's sake. Holy moly! I have more control over it this way. I'm the head. I'm the head, man. I'm the head. <laughs> She's the neck that turns the head. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> moving rapidly along, we must grow past infancy. Length of time being born again does not constitute maturity. I, yes. Get, get your Bible out. I got it right here. No, get ready before you jump up here. My favorite passage. All right. This is my favorite passage. I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm just going to butt in here. <laughs> I mean, what have you done? So, so I know. Well, yeah. where were you? I was in, in the okay. office. All right. I was working. I, I read verses 7 through 16, and I'm on point number one. Chapter of Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. 4. 
7 through 16, and now I'm dialing in on verses 14 through 16. Point number one. So you said we must grow most of us, faith. almost all of us in here have been 35 years or more. 35 years or more believers. Yeah. We're a Wednesday night crowd, too. So I guess, and this is why I jumped up, how grown up are we? How grown up are we? You know, you can be a believer for, sadly, 50 years and still be the biggest baby. Everything gets on your nerves. Everything bugs you. You get mad over everything at the drop of a hat. Somebody sneezes the wrong direction. You take offense. If they're wearing perfume in here, you can't take it. If they're, if they're you know, any and everything. That's now are you called, talking to us personally? I'm what? talking to anybody. Uh, if it's you, <laughs> okay. if the shoe fits, <laughs> you just take that thing. But the whole idea is that we're not supposed to be uh, children anymore. We're supposed to grow up. And part of that grow up process is, no offense, you just suck it up. <laughs> Forgive people. Let it go. Don't hang on to that junk. Some of you are, are, are dealing, and I don't know this for a fact, but I just sense, some. let me say it this way. Some of you may be dealing with stuff that happened 10, 20, 30, 40, depending on your age. Take your age, subtract about five. Some of you are dealing with that much junk in your life that you need to let it go. You need to let it go. Just forgive whoever bugged you. Forgive whoever offended you. Babies can't do that. Babies are just going around going, mine, 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 and, and sucking up everything around them. You know, babies need a lot of attention. They need it because... They don't have the ability to take care of themselves, right? Right. But if you're a believer for 35 years, guess what? Scripturally, you should be able to take care of yourself. You should be able to feed yourself. You should be able to go potty by yourself. You should be able to wipe your buns by yourself. You should be able to take care of yourself. You should be able to forgive. You should be able to, to let things go. You should be a a presence of peace. Right. Good word. That is a good word. You should be a, I'm going to say it again. You should be a presence of peace instead of an instigator of a tornado. <laughs> Let me just say it that way. Is that a good picture? Can you see the difference? And uh, scripture here in verse, whatever it is, four, <laughs> chapter four, verse I'll tell you here in a second. I didn't write the verses down on my little paper. 14, we should no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves. Tossed back and forth. Everything, you're up and down on everything. If the sun's out, you're happy. That's kind of me. I'm telling on me now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not saying any one of us are perfect. I'm just saying... As grown-ups, we need to change and become a little better at stuff. That's all. And uh, we shouldn't be like the boat on a wild, stormy sea. We should get a little more, more level. We shouldn't have high highs and low lows. And I know some people actually have a medical imbalance. And, and um, I don't remember the new term, but the old term is manic depressive. Bipolar. Bipolar. I don't know why that's any better. To be honest, you know, they want to make, they come up with some new term to make it sound better. It's the same stuff. It doesn't matter what you call it. Every knee, every name is going to bow its knee to Jesus, including yes. whether it's bipolar or manic depressive or whatever thing you have. Okay? Could be arthritis. That, that has to bow its knee. Yes. And as a grown-up believer, we're not tossed to and fro every time something happens. Okay? And then the other thing I wanted to say, there's three things in this verse that is our problem. We no longer are to be children tossed here and there by, the, by waves and carried about, one, by every wind of doctrine. 
If you hear some new doctrine, you better line it up with scripture. Yes. And yes. then you're not, that's what a grown up does. Right. A baby picks up everything and goes, oh, this is the greatest sounding thing I've ever heard. But you don't know what scripture says. If you're a right. grown up, you got to know what the word says. You got to balance every win. And believe me, it's a win. Hmm. Um, I don't know how many of you uh, realize this and they may still do it there's some churches who have now started meeting in bars right to be more to be uh more relevant, more relevant. and they have just a little beer a little wine little little uh hard liquor that's a wind that's a wind faith teaching came along guess what that's a wind but it's grounded faith is a lifestyle Without faith, it is impossible to please him. Say, so you need to take what you're hearing because there's stuff, especially in the last days, there's a lot of stuff that's going to be blowing around in the air that you need to grab if you're going to grab it and then compare it to the scripture. Right. And allow the Holy Spirit to minister to you and keep you on the straight and narrow. That's what grown-ups do. Just, oh, I heard this new thing. I'm just going to run right over there. Why are you running over there? You need to find out if what they're teaching is right or not before you go running over there. Come on. And then, by trickery of men, oh, I can't imagine that in the church. Oh, come on. <laughs> come on. We've got some people in pulpits that aren't grown up either. Right. Come on. And um, I think it was Paul. I think it was Paul that said um, when they were doing some shady stuff. He says, well, I don't really care as long as the gospel is being preached. So all I'm saying is we, including me, we need to grow up. We need to compare different doctrines or some new thing that you hear about. Compare it with scripture. Find out. Pray about it. Have the Holy Spirit illuminate you. Don't go run into everything just because it's new. Because believe me, according to Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under That's the sun. Right. Yeah. It may be repackaged. <laughs> it may look a little different, but it's the same. If it's not godly, it's the same demon underneath. <laughs> and then last but not least, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. You know, s some people are just out to trick you, to get your money. You know, the whole church gets labeled for that. But we're trying to establish the kingdom of God. We're not really trying to stab establish our own thing. We want the gospel to be preached. We want people to become born again. And it really went, that really uh, nabbed my heart when there's so many people here that I believe we're mature for the most part. But it's also sad that we're not, we're not having children. Let me say it that way. In the kingdom, I just don't think we stop not bearing. We need to bear children. We need to bear fruit, and we need to bear ch children. We don't need to be children. We need to bear children. Now, what am I supposed to do? Okay. I wouldn't have butted in, but... <laughs> <laughs> so uh, a lot of times when I get uh, to to the building get to around people I get a picture sometimes it's for then sometimes it's for later and this made absolutely no sense whatsoever and so I didn't say anything to pastor or anybody until <clears throat> now and um, a lot have how many of you ever saw Ghostbusters so um, a lot of times, you know, um, we can't grow up because we've been slimed. <laughs> the enemy sometimes keeps us by what he does. You know, we, I, we can't blame the enemy for everything. Right. But sometimes it's true that we get slimed. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm here to tell you, we have people in the body 
that know how to be slime busters. Come on. So if you feel like you're in, in the condition that you can't grow, that you can't, uh, <laughs> I just thought of some way. <laughs> Pastor knows this person. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do a lot at the Bible school up here. <clears throat> and so one time when I was up here for a spiritual, speaking for a spiritual <laughs> meeting, <laughs> this kid comes up to me <clears throat> who's now a pastor. And I won't say where, <laughs> I guess. Anyway, <laughs> he comes up to me and says, Lloyd, why don't I have any personality? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and what makes it so funny, he really doesn't have oh a personality. No. He's, he's just like a dial tone. But oh. anyhow. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Pastor dial tone. Um, <laughs> but here's the point. The enemy can do things to us that keep us from reaching our destiny. That's right. Yes. And... Um, if you feel like uh, you have done what you know you needed to do mm -hmm. and you feel like that your destiny has been interrupted by being slimed by the enemy, I want you to stand yep. up. Yep. Who's going to bust the slime? Come on. Amen. Yeah. Yes, Lord. Because God yes, is Lord. great at rerouting That's dead right. ends. That's Are you listening right. to me? Yes. God is really great at rerouting dead ends. Yeah. When you reach a dead end, it doesn't mean it's over. God can, even if the way is forever blocked, even if the enemy's built something so strong that you can't see a way to get around it, God can make a new road if that's he right. has to. That's right. So everybody that just find somebody that's standing up, reach out towards them, and let's pray together. Thank Father, God. in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name at which everything must bow, the name that is so powerful that some people can't even mention God's name is so powerful. And Lord, we know that the use of your name is not to be taken lightly, and we do so with uh, fear and trembling, fear only that we might do it in a wrong way, and trembling because we want to do what is most profitable to the body of Christ. And we come in that name, that awesome name of Jesus. And here stands your people. The Lord, they have be, be felt like they've been slimed by the enemy. But God, we know how to bust this up. We know how to break it. We know how to bring a rerouting of their destiny. And Father, you have meant that we should reach the place that you have ordained for us on this earth. And the enemy cannot, he must not, and he will not stop us from reaching our destiny. Lord, we, we by the authority of Jesus' name and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, we speak rerouting around the blockage in Jesus' name. We speak dissipation of what the enemy has done. We break, Lord, every chain that he's put upon us. Let chains begin to disintegrate. Let chains begin to dissolve. Let chains, Lord, fall off hands and feet and minds. Clear up minds, Lord. Let them see what you want them to see. Let them see the end from the beginning. Let there be revelation. Let there be wisdom, God. We've got a work to do. We can't do it in our own. We can't do it because when the enemy comes against us. Lord, but we want to do the job. Now, O oh, Holy Ghost of God, come in our midst and break every chain and break everything till we reach our destiny. mama. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 And let that visa show up tomorrow in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. <laughs>Okay. That's what you call a divine interruption.
you can come you can come back that scripture goes on to say i think i think that was so good uh what the lord what the lord had lloyd do Whoa. because once that's broken off we've got to continue on in that scripture what that it says, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects, in all aspects, into Him, the Head, Christ. And I just want to, I just want to say, from Sunday morning, John spoke from um, Romans twelve one and two. Um, I beseech you, brothers, this is part of how we grow up. I beseech you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. You present your bodies. I want you to say this with me. Father, I present my body right now. I thank you for for cleansing. I thank you for removing slime. I thank you that even like in Russia, when that wall came down, Lord God, I, um, in Berlin, and, and that the wall came down, Lord God, I thank you that tonight walls have come down in the name of Jesus. Slime has been removed in the name of Jesus. And, Lord God, we are willing and able to grow up into the head, which is Christ, in all aspects. In all aspects, Lord God. So we present our bodies right now living and a holy sacrifice, Lord God, acceptable to you. This is our spiritual service of worship is to present ourselves to you, Lord God. And Lord God, we will not be conformed to this world. In other words, we're not going to take the lies of the enemy of this world and conform to that nonsense and call it truth. It's not truth. It's a lie. We will not be conformed to the things of this world. We will not call good evil, and we will not call evil good in the name of Jesus. We are going to be transformed instead by the renewing of our mind. I want you to place your hands right on your head where your mind is. Heavenly Father, we just ask you, we ask you to help us even right now begin to have our mind renewed to the Word of God. I ask you to remove any blinders. I ask you to remove any any, any uh, hindrances in, in Jesus' name. I thank you that our minds are open to the Spirit of God, that we hear the Spirit of God. Lord God, we listen and we hearken and we... And we, and we learn from the Spirit of God that our minds are being renewed, that we may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Lord God, I thank you for renewed minds. I thank you for the beginning steps of renewed minds where we take your word just like we're doing right now with Romans 12, 1 and 2, and we begin to apply it, and we begin to pray over it, and we begin to sow into our own lives. Lord God, your word, that your word can come in and change us in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, that we right now, even as we are studying your word in this Wednesday night, and we're reading your word, and we're heeding your word, and we are sowing your word into ourselves, Lord God, that our mind becomes renewed in the name of Jesus. And Lord God, by doing that, we are even right this second growing up. We are growing up in all aspects into Christ Jesus. Lord God, I just thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. All right, back to me, huh? Okay, okay. We have 10 minutes left, so. (laughs) I think I'll just leave this mic on. How's that? Pass this around. So anyway, um, verse 14, when it talks about no longer infants tossed back and forth by the waves, some Christians are quite content. I'm, re- I'm reading from A.T. Robinson, a Greek, is- a Greek scholar. He writes and says, some Christians are quite content to remain babes in Christ and never cut their eye teeth. It's the eye teeth that you eat meat with. Okay? The victims of every charlatan who comes along 
He then says, infants, oh, then uh, the New Testament study Bible writes and says, infants, children are weak, inexperienced, easily fooled. I like this next comment. Listen very clearly. This world is like an obstacle course. We reach our eternal goal only by using all of God's help to avoid the mud holes, the barbed wire, the barriers, and everything else the devil puts in our way to send us off in the wrong direction. And if we remain infants, that's what happens. We get spun off in the wrong direction. When God wants us to know how to navigate that and to grow and to mature. Verse 15 says that we will instead speak the truth and love, grow to become the mature body of him who is the head, that's Christ. So rather than being children, we must grow up into Christ the full stature. Truth spoken without love can destroy the one who uses it. Revelation 2, 4 through 5, when Jesus speaks to the church, he says, return to your first love. Go back and do the things you did once again. But he did it in a way that they could receive it. And then verse 16 talks about the head who is Jesus Christ. Helen's already talked about that. As the head, Christ literally does control his body. Under his control, all the different parts of the body, that's Jew, Gentile, slave, free, man, or woman. Listen to this. Fit together in synergetic, com- synergetic community where the whole is greater than the sum parts. The health and growth of the whole body depends upon the functioning of each and every member. That's why we need you whole and healthy. That's why we need you without the slime. Because then we can fully function in all the cylinders that we need to function in. But when we are, when we are, uh, uh, you ever, you ever had the flu? Anybody? I hate the flu. I mean, I hate sick. Period. I just don't plan on getting sick. I don't believe for sick. I mean, I just don't buy into that and believe that. And 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 happens. We live in a fallen world. It's very rare I'm sick. I just don't believe for it. So I'm very rare that I am. I just confess that I'm healed and I walk in divine health. I mean, there's a difference between getting healed and walking in divine health. My prayer for all of you is you walk in divine health. But if you've ever had the flu, and I'm not exalting it or whatever, but there is what happens is your body immune system is worn down, and you're weak, and you're sick, you can't function, your your eyes may water, your nose may run, your body aches. Anybody ever had that? Uh, Again, I'm not exalting that. I'm just saying we've all been there. I don't ever want to be there again. But it's, it's like that, and when you have a person in the body that, are, that have their resistance has been worn down for whatever reason, because of the sliming that Lloyd talked about, which is so apropos, what ends up happening, they are like that low-grade fever all the time. Low-grade fever all the time. They're walking around with a low-grade fever all the time and are not functioning to the full potential of what God's ordained for their life. It is truly the heart of the Lord to come to full stature, full maturity. Now, I have one thing I want to close with, so if you have some, something else, go on, because then I'm going, to be, I'm going to wrap it with one final thing. I just want to um, continue on in that verse where it says, from whom Christ the head, the whole body is being fitted and held together. But that fitting, for instance, just like my fingers, I can fit that. In fact, I was trying to show Natalie how to do, here's the church, here's the steeple, you know, where you go like this. You know, that's a hard thing for a little kid to do, is to get their fingers to go under. Well, it's a hard thing in the natural for all of us different people to be fitted together. But the local church, that's what the Lord is doing. He's trying to fit us together the way he wants it, not the way we want it, the way he wants it to be fitted together. And how is it fitted together? It's by that which every joint supplies. So we could just say it like this. I'm a joint. You're a joint. And the way we fit together is you supply something and I supply something. In the Lord, every part is supplying something. Think, I mean, the example is your own body. Every part of your body, every cell of your body is supplying something to your body. Everything. Everything. All of our... um, I want to say our internal organs are being protected by our ribs, our structure, our muscles, our skin. It's holding them inside there. 
maybe are fat. <laughs> but everything in your body is supplying parts. Same thing in the body of Christ. That's what Christ wants to do. Christ is a head. We don't need 18,000 heads. We've got one head. That's Christ. In our family, John was teasing, in our family, he's the head. I can have input. I can do whatever. But if he said sit down, I'd go sit down. In our family, he's the head of me. So part of that is my understanding who I am in the body of Christ and where I fit and what I supply. Who I am, where I fit, and what I supply. And when I know that, and you know that, and we all know that, and we're fitting and supplying, guess what? We have room for growth. We have room, you know, we don't have room for growth when... Uh, Part of the body's running down the street over there. The other part's running down the street over here. And the other, be, because it's disorganized, it's disjointed, nobody knows where they fit, and nobody can come in to fit. They don't want to. They don't want to. And it's according to the proper working of each individual part. So we're being fitted together. Every part has something to supply, and when it's properly working under the headship of God, it's amazing. I don't know uh, how many of you have seen those uh, silly Transformer movies when they transform into something, but if you, the interesting thing to me and why, well, the reason I thought of it, I think, is because the way those moving parts change. They still function together even in the changing. As a, as a body of Christ, we're changing constantly because we're being changed to become more like Christ at every moment. But that does not mess up what God is doing. In fact, it enhances what he's doing. It makes us more powerful. It makes us more mobile. It makes us more active. It makes us more, we've, we've got the punch of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's, there's a transformation not only individually, but there's a transformation in the body. And that transformation is the next part. It causes the growth of the body. We don't stay the same, not individually and not corporately. And I think as this third year anniversary, this is where God wants us to go. He wants us to become that we realize who we are, how we fit together, how I work properly. And then God's going to cause the growth of the body and the, for the building of itself up in love. I don't need to tear you down. I don't need to tear anybody down in this body because that's not how we're building each other up. We are to build each other up in love. I can tell you how beautiful you are. I can. I can tell you what great gifts you have. I can, I can build you up. I do not need to tear you down to make me feel better. I do not have to go around like a little child and go mine, 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 mine. Instead, I can go around and give, 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 give. Because we're joining together. We're being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part, and it causes the growth of the body for the building of itself up in love. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. So we've wrestled around trying to figure out what Ian is. We try to fit him into that evangelist thing. When in reality, he's, he's got a pastor's heart, and he's really pastoral more than he's an evangelist. He tells his people about Jesus all the time, but his heart is really pastoral. I look at Sherry back her. She is pastoral with the mercy bent on her. Dave is pastoral. It's the same way. And he also has the gift of helps. Karen, administration, 
She likes things in order, and that's wonderful. Likes organized things. That's administration. Tim's got a little bit of that on him, too. He has that system structure thing. He's also gifted in music. So a lot of gifts will interweave. What we want to do is we want to say, Lord, how can... And by the way, all of our giftings and their application, the body is subject to life season, how much time we can give or how much time we can't because of life, family, all of that. We all understand that. But God's really dialing in. Many of you sitting here, you have gift of helps and gift of service. I look at Dave Bennett now. I don't ever have to say, uh, do the signs need to go out? He doesn't have to ask me that. I come. He's here before I'm. He's sitting in the parking lot. He's drinking his coffee. Those signs are out there. Boom, 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 boom. He's putting them out there. Rod comes and he has those buckets ready. He's putting them together. These guys and those of you that are helping with that, you're dialing in. I think of the worship team. That really is the gift of helps that helps the presence of the Lord come into this place. Not only that, but probably you have the gift of a psalmist or the gift of a, of a, a minstrel. And Helen has the gift of the chief musician as she puts that all together. So everybody's beginning. Some of you are intercessors. You're pressing into intercession. Some of you prophesy and are emerging in that capacity in a greater way. In fact, your wife is a prophetess. She's an itinerant prophetess sent from word and spirit. She's down in California right now for the next couple of weeks ministering to the glory of God. Had a blowout service this last Sunday. She called me. To, she had a wonderful time. And we're just going to pray for her and believe that God blesses her because she goes out and she comes in. So God's dialing his church in. I'm leaving. I'm going. I have an apostolic bent on my life. I want to raise a team that it doesn't matter if I'm here or not. This thing goes on. I told John, Mark, and Holly, they were sitting at my house. It was yesterday night. I don't know why I've got so many meetings going. Mon no, it's Tuesday night. It was last night. And I says, listen, I'm raising up your generation. They're the 20-somethings. I'm looking to pour my life into those 20 and 30-somethings. Not that I'm neglecting anybody else here. But listen, we've got to turn this thing over to somebody for the next generation. John Mark had a great, brilliant thing. He says, Dad, why don't you, why don't you ask everybody who's doing something, from ushers to greeters to, to the computer people to everything, the t TV techs, he says, when we're here on a Wednesday night, get their kids to be with them to see what they do, to shadow them, to watch what they're doing right then and there so they're learning now. I said, son, that's awesome. What a great idea. We're, we're training them. Sound. Yeah, yes, dad and son back here. All right, I close with this. Slime, slime situation. Hopefully this doesn't take more than five minutes, but it's very apropos to what you said, Lloyd, about slime and Helen dialing it all together because sometimes people are incapable of moving to that destiny that God's ordained for them because of baggage. God wants to free us all of the baggage. I believe some baggage got freed up here tonight. People left some stuff. You all heard my story. I grew up in a family that my mom and dad, my dad was Catholic, my mom was Episcopalian. They got married. They got born again. I was a little boy, got dedicated to Jesus. At five, I gave my life to the Lord. They raised our family in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. All four of us kids, my older sister, who's two years older, my brother, who's two years younger, and my other brother, who's three years younger, my baby brother. I got a call on Monday afternoon from my dad. And he says, they're rushing your brother to the hospital right now in another town. Takes two hours by car, but he had to go by plane because he was bleeding. And so they got him in this plane or helicopter, whatever it was, and they transported him to the next town that was a bigger hospital, could handle his situation. He was bleeding internally from like it would be the equivalent of varicose veins in his esophagus. And they had banded some of this earlier, but something had broke loose and he was bleeding. My brother for the last year and a half has looked gaunt, jaundiced, looking older beyond his years, alarming to all of us. And I'm detached because I'm so far away, I can't see it visibly. I talked to him on the phone. Now, my brother would binge drink now and then, but I did not know that for the last, basically from the time he was in junior high till now, he has not gone without alcohol every day of his life. I didn't know that. Basically, cirrhosis of the liver. When he got there, the doctor says, we aren't going to give you a liver because you're, you, you've been drinking right up to this point, and it would be a waste. No way. 
they were able, and I, my dad called me, and I says, I didn't get, I didn't get scared, I didn't get nervous. I just says, we're, I rose up on the inside of me. I says, we're going to pray, number one, that my brother would know that he knows that he's right with God. That's the most important thing, that he's right with Jesus, that those things my dad and mom instilled in him would come to remembrance. He'd grasp a hold of them. He'd be right with God. That's the most important thing. I says, you know what? We're all going to die sometime. But we better be right with God because that's the most important thing. I said, secondly, we're going to contend for his physical body. This would be a turnaround for him, that God would touch him. And I'm even though God didn't do that. He did that to himself with the enemy's help because of the slime. Because my family is steeped in alcoholism on both sides. My mom's brother died at 19 when he was drunker than a skunk, climbed over a fence at a city pool, jumped in and drowned at 19. That is not normal. My grandpa died at 55 years of age of a heart attack directly related to acute alcoholism. My aunt barely made it past 50 and died of alcoholic kinds of things. The other brother, two other brothers, their other brothers, same thing, alcoholism. Have you know, that's not a God. That's a curse. That's a family curse. I have chosen to be a teetotaler myself personally for that very reason. Okay, that's my conviction. So I prayed thirdly for his wife, and then fourthly I prayed that, I says, I agree with my dad. I says, Dad, we're two or three agree as anything in your name. You'll do it for them. I says, Dad, we're believing that the call in my brother's life, at the second half of his life, it shall be fulfilled in Jesus' name. He will arise to the call of God on his life, and he'll be restored to walk in that. So they went in, did surgery on Tuesday, and we got the report back that they were able to go in, st stop the bleeding, do what they needed to do to correct things. And the doctor said to him, listen, you are a very lucky man. I says, no, he's a blessed man. God's favor was on him in that situation. He literally almost died. 53 years old. Then the doctor said to him, and I, I give kudos to the doctor, you cannot drink another drop of alcohol in your life. Everybody deals with stuff with family. I mean, my mom and dad did what they know to do to instill the principles. But both my brothers, my sister, they have those principles in them. And I pray for the restoration of my entire family. I pray over them. I say, Lord, I see my family saved. I see my, my family's mates saved. My, my nieces, my nephews saved. I see them water baptized. I see them full of the Holy Ghost. I see them planted in church. I see them giving tithes, offerings, and alms, using their gifts to the glory of God. I pray that over my family. That's my declaration. I said all that to say this as we wind down today. What you said was so apropos. Both of you was so apropos in terms of, of us as people that the thing that hinders is what we allow to remain to hinder. It's time to walk in our freedom. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. There's freedom. Let's stand. Come up here, honey, would you please? You have to obey me, too. <laughs> Grab somebody's hand, please. You can't hug them because they're not your wife or husband. Well, maybe they are. Father, I thank you for these stalwart saints, men and women of God, 35 years or more, at least two-thirds. We rejoice in that. The Father, we're also concerned that we want to do our part to see that next generation arise. We want to see those that do not yet know you as Savior and Lord come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. I thank you how you orchestrated this service tonight. Thank you for tag team preaching and teaching, Lord. Thank you for the release of the anointing of the Holy Ghost to do what you wanted to do in this place tonight, that us together were just like the message talked about, each joint doing its part to accomplish the whole. So, Father, we saw it in action made manifest by the Holy Spirit as you led in the preaching tonight. 
Father, I thank you that in Jesus' name, the words that were spoken, Lord God, we receive them. We take them to heart. Things have been set free in people's lives today. The slime has come off in Jesus' name. Hearts, Lord God, have been sent, uh, tenderized, Lord God, open and laid bare to whom we must give an account. Father, I believe there's a change in a rearrangement. We receive it by faith. And Lord, now we move forward as we walk in the purposes of God. I thank you for these men and women who have served so faithfully. I thank you for our, our greeters. I thank you for our ushers. I thank you for usherettes. I thank you for sound. I thank you for worship team. I thank you for administrators. I thank you, Lord Jesus, for children's workers, nursery workers. I pray blessing on our nursery workers back there right now. I pray blessing on our kids and on our, and our youth right now in Jesus' name. Thank you for the, the sound techs. I thank you for the media techs that do our computer. I thank you for all the stuff that's unseen that nobody knows about, that only you do. God, what's done in secret, reward them over. Openly in Jesus' name, I pray for an outpouring of your spirit in an unprecedented measure, God, that this next year as we embark upon our third year, Lord God, it will be like never before. It will be an explosion of the things of God because the people of God are finding their place, each part doing its part to the glory of God. We thank you and give you praise for it today as we declare that we've been set free by the blood and the authority and the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. And Heavenly Father, we just call forth from the north, the south, the east, to the west, those that belong in this house, Lord God. I just thank you for young people, Lord God, believers that, that come to know you, that haven't known you before. I thank you for those one-year-olds, five-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 20-year-olds, 30-year-olds in Christ, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God, for a healthy body, Lord God, of every age, of every uh, believer in growth process, Lord God. I thank you, Lord God. I just I just declare that, that this house is open and ready for those that you would save daily. I thank you for daily people being saved and coming into the kingdom because of because of people in this house, Lord God, for the body of this house, Lord God. I thank you that that even as the disciples turn the known world upside down, Lord God, we can turn Eugene Springfield, Lane County upside down for the kingdom of God. I just thank you, Lord God, that I see by the eye of faith this body just moving, moving, Lord God to take kingdom the, and establish your kingdom here in this, in this area, Lord God. There is nothing too hard. There's nothing too difficult. But by your Holy Spirit, by your leadership, Lord Jesus, we can take territory. We can see people daily being born again, Lord God. We can rejoice, Lord God, that their names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And Lord God, I thank you for signs, wonders, and, and things that accompany your word, Lord God. They just go along. As we share your word, I just thank Thank you that signs, wonders, and, and miracles just accompany in the name of Jesus. And we just thank you, and we just, we just commission your people, Lord God, to be led by you, be led by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Say what the Spirit says to say. Do what the Spirit says to do, Lord God. I thank you for an obedient house, Lord God, to the headship as we grow up into Jesus Christ. And everybody said amen.